All right, so homeostasis, I defined it in class last time. What I want to do today is go through the steps. It's kind of the first physiology topic we talk about in 430. And here are the steps. I have six of them listed, and there's an example here. Call it homeostatic processes. They give an example of um, body temperature. Could be anything. Could be blood pressure. Could be blood sugar. Could be anything. The body has a way to react to external stimuli and maintain some kind of balance. I like how they use the teeter totter, teeter totter thing because you can have an imbalance too high or too low. So let's do I don't know. Let's do this imbalance. Let's say the imbalance of body temperature is is too high. How does the body respond to, if it's too high, how does the body respond to lower it? Okay, so just go through the steps and ask yourself, number one, what's the disturbance? What's the stimulus that's disrupting or disturbing homeostasis? In this example is uh, maybe you're working out, exercising, and body temperature increases. So what does the body do to kind of keep from overheating? Um, the thing to understand about physiology is the body needs a mechanism to detect the disturbance. So that's step two. What's the sensor receptor? What is the mechanism to detect the disturbance? How to detect this disturbance. So the example is an increase in body temp and um, it says temperature sensitive cells in the skin and brain. Okay, so let's just say temperature sensitive cells. cells have to have a communication to some CPU, to some computer, to some processing unit that can take the information, figure out how to respond, and mobilize the correct signal. Okay, so to send the signal to the CPU, it's called um, the afferent pathway. Okay, so there's an afferent pathway to the control center, which is step three. I'll put it I'll list a fair pathway under step two. A fair means to go into the central nervous system. Like um, when you're affected, you receive news, it goes into you. What's the effect? Depends on what the news is. You know, I got an A on my test. Woohoo! That's the information coming in. And how do you react? What comes out of you? Joy, happiness, smiles. Okay. Um, so the effect is what comes out of you, what the affect is going in. So in physiology, the afferent pathway are nerve signals going to the brain. All right. So step three, I just call it the, the CPU, the central processing unit. What is receiving this information? It has the means to know what to do with it. In this example, it's the brain. And so there's a thermoregulatory center in the brain. brain, thermo, regulatory, center. So the brain receives information, body's too hot, and mobilizes the correct output. So number four, what's the output command coming from the brain?
output slash command. In this example, well, it's not a ferrin, it's, it's the efferent pathway, the, the motor nerves that are carrying the signal from the brain to something. Okay. The afferent and the efferent pathway, think of them as telephone cables. Wires in your body, which are actually nerve fibers that carry the signal. And so the output command has to affect something to lower body temperature. And so step five is what's acting as the effector. You know, essentially what's being affected by the efferent pathway. And in this case, it's uh, glands that can lower body temperature. So they say, um, hmm. Sweat glands. The effectors are sweat glands. Sweat glands, you sweat, you put moisture on skin. The skin, um, well, the moisture evaporates from the skin and it cools the body off. On skin, moisture evaporates. So, lastly, I put what's the response? Well, number six is always going to be the reverse of number one because you're trying to correct uh, the imbalance. Decrease body temp. You know, sweating is a sympathetic response. You exercise, from the moment you start, a certain amount of time passes, a few minutes, and you start sweating. Okay, because the body picks up on this, the body temperature increases. Um, sweating is actually an adaptation. In other words, Fit people sweat, sweat more, and they sweat sooner within the bout of exercise. Okay, um, unfit people sweat less. Okay, and because it's beneficial. So, anyways, as a kind of a side note, the imbalance could go the other way. Body temperature could be too cold. Okay, um, let's see. Get my little half sheets. Why don't I everyone get a half sheet here? Like we did before. And on your half sheet, you do the same six steps for the opposite imbalance. Body temperature is too low. If you can't read it on here, find it in your book, or maybe you printed it out. And if you did it, maybe someone next to you did. And if none of you did, I guess you got to walk up because it's too small to see. Go ahead, take a few minutes and do the opposite and balance. Oh, I'm sorry. So what I want you to do on your half sheet, do the same thing. Put all six steps or the decrease in body temperature. I'll do number one for you. What's the stimulus? Body temperature falls. Yeah. What are you going to do for number two? Just follow the figure. Okay, and go through all six steps, what I just did. I'll check back in a few minutes. And again, this is a time where you can talk. You don't have to be quiet if you don't want to. Ask for help if you need it. And the person standing next to you, or for me.
That's right. a little more time that I'm just going to move on. I will not reveal the answers, okay? but we're going to practice more. Okay? Sometimes I just tell you what the right answer is. Sometimes I don't because we're going to do this many more times. I'm just going to move on for a few seconds. So always attempt to answer something. When you turn these in and I grade it, I just look to see that you answered everything. You attempted some kind of competent answer.
I don't know if you guys checked the grade book. For those of you you did, how much are the half sheets worth? Two points. So that gives me a little bit of gradation there. If you didn't answer some questions, I'm not giving you two points. Maybe I'll give you one point. Okay, if you answered some of the questions and they're all wrong, it doesn't look like you're trying very hard, I'll give you zero. Okay, so really just uh, give a honest try and you'll get the full points. It's probably the easiest points you'll get in my class, these little half sheet things. Uh, it's also how I grade for attendance. Okay. Because I don't, I don't always take role just the first week. Well, another thing to define negative feedback as we get into this homeostasis. The negative feedback systems, the output shuts off the original stimulus. Let's write that down. Negative feedback. Original stimulus. Another example, regulation of blood glucose. Before I move on, the, the example I did on the board I will tell you that was negative feedback because once the body temperature fell back to normal, the stimulus ends. Okay? And the same thing you did on your half sheet, when the body temperature rose again, it's over. Okay? So, and also when you're too cold, you should probably put on a jacket as well. It doesn't mention it there, but of course. Um, all right, so let's look at this example here. The regulation of blood Glucose, example number two. The blood level of glucose should be maintained in the fastest state. Less than 100 mg per deciliter is the normal value. Fasted is, you know, you haven't eaten for 12 hours. Okay, should be 100 or less. That's kind of the normal value. Oh, of course, you eat a meal. It's going to elevate, right? Get your blood glucose up. Eat an apple, eat pasta. Um, so let's do this imbalance where it's too high because you ate a meal. Say so eat pasta. So step number one. What's the disturbance and increase in blood glucose? So again, step two, you have to have a mechanism to detect that change. And there are glucose sensors in the pancreas. Some of the blood vessels that take blood to the um, pancreas have these glucose sensors in them. Number two, so the sensor or receptor is the pancreas. Now, I know you haven't had anatomy yet. The pancreas is a gland. It's a gland, rather large gland, and it looks like that, but it's behind the stomach. That's where it is in the body, in the body cavity. So the pancreas uh, has glucose sensors. Okay, they're going to basically detect the increase in glucose. All right, so again, next step, number three, the control center. What is receiving the information and what is interpreting it and providing the correct output. In this case, it's also the pancreas. It's detecting the increase and it's going to secrete the right hormone to lower blood glucose. So for step three, also going to put pancreas. For step four, what does the pancreas do? What's the output? What's the command? It secretes a hormone into the bloodstream called insulin. So I'll give you a little visual here. Pretend you have a blood vessel. And you ate a meal. And it, had, it was pasta, and there was a lot of sugar in it. And you got your blood sugar up. And those um, sugar molecules were absorbed 
into the intestines. So let's say this is glucose, little blue dots. So glucose is the blue dots. But now you're secreting insulin into the bloodstream with the glucose. We'll use a different color. Uh, how about orange? So you got elevated glucose, and now insulin is circulating with the glucose in an effort to take the glucose out of the blood. So insulin has, is a hormone that can communicate with other cells to do this. And so what's affected, step number five, the effector, they say tissue cells and liver. I would say it's primarily um, skeletal muscle and adipose fat for the tissue cells. Well, let's kind of put it, it's what's affected. What are your insulin sensitive tissues? So number five, skeletal muscle. Ooh, I said adipose. And they put a big picture of liver. Yeah, okay, th those things can respond to insulin. So let's, um, I don't know, let me put a generic cell from one of these things here, or cell. Well, let's call it a target cell. Not all cells respond to insulin, but a cell from uh, those things do. So insulin will leave the bloodstream. And let's say there's a receptor for insulin and it's going to bind its receptor and it's going to trigger a signal that the cell will be able to um, put its glucose transporters at the cell surface so it can take up the glucose. Okay. So I, basically all, all this stuff I'm describing step six for response. So I'll put target cell response to insulin. Target cells respond to insulin. So let's pretend that there's, um, let's not pretend this is what, it, how, what really happens. There are glucose transporters, I've drawn as these circles, blue circles, right? Um, normally they hang out in the middle of the cell. In response to insulin, they, trans, they literally move, they translocate to the surface. So imagine these, they kind of they all go to the surface, okay? And when they do that, it's like they're, they're able to kind of like fuse with the cell membrane, and then the glucose, my little blue balls, by diffusion, they'll kind of like be taken up by the cell. And then the cell has its energy, right? It can burn it, it can metabolize it for energy, it can store it, right? So that's how the target cells respond. Ultimately what you're doing is you're taking glucose out of the blood into the tissues, okay, into the cell. So the response is you lower blood glucose. So I'll put that as the last thing here, decrease blood glucose. One thing I want to put here, they put for liver, glucose, glycogen. Those are words you should know. So I'm running out of room here. Let me erase some of these top steps. So I know I drew this picture here. What I would do after class, I would review this picture. When you, if you don't look at it until tomorrow, you'll be like, what the heck is this? But if you rehearse it as many times as you can between now and tomorrow, you won't forget. Any questions on what I did here? A lot of steps. The insulin bound its receptor. The cell responded by making these glucose transporters move to the surface. This is what normally should happen. What if the cell doesn't respond to insulin? Isn't that a problem? If the cell doesn't respond to insulin, what's going to happen to the glucose levels? They will remain high, and we call that diabetes. That's actually type 2 diabetes where your body's insensitive to glucose or your body's insensitive to insulin. People think diabetes 
is a problem with sugar. It's not. It's a problem with insulin. That's the problem. I mean, the, the high sugar can cause all kinds of clinical problems. Uh, that's why we need endocrinologists. But um, what I wanted to say, I got a little off track here, that uh, picture. Let's see. Okay. Actually, I lost my train of thought. I think I said enough. Um, look at the other disturbance. blood glucose levels could get too low. Oh, wait, wait, okay, let me backtrack. I remember what I wanted to do. I wanted to find glucose to glycogen, that's it. Glucose is a monomer. That's glucose. It, it's one molecule or monomer. It's a building block. Think of insulin um, as a tissue building hormone. Think of it as a trigger. Your body releases insulin after you eat a meal. You eat dinner, what was the point of eating? Nutrition, okay? So you eat dinner, you rest, you go to the couch, you know, watch TV, you go to bed. Insulin does its job. It, it, it increases your body stores. So one of the things the liver does is it takes all these glucose molecules and stores them in the form of glycogen by linking them together. Just kind of draw, you know. I don't want to draw, but it's a chain, okay? Glycogen is a the storage form of glucose, and so you just kind of add the monomers to it. Insulin has the ability to do that. You increase your glycogen stores with insulin. So that's what I wanted to say. The difference between glucose, which is a monomer, and glycogen, which is a, it's a I guess you call it a polymer. Monomer and polymer are more generic terms. To be specific for sugars or carbohydrates, you would want to say um, monosaccharide, polysaccharide. So think of glucose as a monosaccharide, glycogen is a polysaccharide. So you have to eat carb to get carb. You eat starch. Starch is the storage form of sugar for plants. We eat it, we store it as glycogen. Glycogen is the storage form of carb for uh, mammals. Okay, so the other imbalance uh, is just going to be the inverse. Let's kind of go through that. Actually, you do it on your half sheet. Go. Take a few minutes. Do the other imbalance. Blood sugar falls. Go through the steps. How does blood sugar raise?
Check back in here. Uh, so basically, you saw the opposite and balance. I know you went through the steps. I'll take a look at it. Uh, but let's just kind of point out the other hormone that was used. For this one, it was insulin. For this down here, what hormone did you put? It's called glucagon. Also comes from the pancreas. Has the opposite effect. I call glucagon the exercise hormone. Okay. Like, um, I don't know, when I, when I jog in the morning. When I start jogging. My blood sugar starts to lower, and I need sugar for my jog for energy. So glucagon gets secreted, and it taps my glycogen to release glucose into the bloodstream, so the glucose can get to the working muscles uh, for energy for doing the work when you work out. Okay, so that was the opposite effect. Uh, Let me move on. Positive feedback. Okay, well, obviously the opposite of negative feedback. What we've been talking about so far, you're kind of shutting off the original stimulus once glucose levels get back to normal, once body temp kind of evens out again. Positive feedback is you want to kind of enhance the original stimulus. Okay, output enhances original stimulus.
blood, blood clotting is pretty much the only one I teach as an example of positive feedback here. You don't see too many examples of it, but it's a good one. Okay, let's go through the steps. Step one, what's the stimulus? Well, look at the picture there. I see a damaged blood vessel. Vessel damage. Bleeding. Okay, that's, that, that's the stimulus. Blood vessels are supposed to carry blood to capillary beds without leaking. So if you get a nick in a big artery and it bleeds, obviously we don't want that. So that's the stimulus. That's not part of the pod back, positive feedback cycle, but that will initiate it. Because what is the, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to make these six things fit every example all the time, but let's try to do it. The sensor or the receptor, what detects this damage is the actual damage. Okay, the vessel, where the vessel is damaged detects that disturbance, so to speak, the bleeding. Um, let's see. I'll say the tissue is damaged. In the vessel. You'll learn this in more detail when you get to the blood chapter in bio 431, but let's just kind of keep it to the figure for now. Um, so you're going to trigger a positive feedback cycle at the area of vessel damage in nowhere else. Okay. So not only does the vessel damage act as the detector, it also acts as the control center. That is where you'll mobilize the response to plug the hole, so to speak. Number three, what is the control center? Again, the area of vessel damage. So what happens is platelets adhere to um, the damaged vessel. Okay. So I'm going to put that as part of number four. The output command. Platelets, for those of you that don't know, are also called thrombocytes. They initiate blood clotting and they always circulate in your blood, but they don't normally bind to anything. They're just circulating. Okay. But when you have a damaged vessel, imagine that there are like um, little collagen fibers that kind of stick up into the flowing blood, and they kind of catch, like fish hooks, catch circulating platelets, and they bind there, okay? Platelets bind to collagen fibers. Um, in the damaged area. Now the reason why I'm putting this in terms of this, the output step is they're going to secrete chemicals, which chemicals don't worry about them, you'll learn them later. But the chemicals, what they're going to do is they're going to attract more platelets to this area of damage. Secrete chemicals. to attract more platelets. And if you attract more platelets, they're all just going to bind to each other in a nice little clump to form a nice plug. And um, so the positive feedback loop part is you secrete more chemicals to attract more platelets, then you secrete even more chemicals to attract more platelets. So the chemicals attract platelets, and then more platelets secrete more chemicals. And that attracts more platelets, and it just keeps going around and around and around and around. More platelets, more chemicals, more platelets, more chemicals, until you accomplish your goal. Platelet plug forms, and you stop the bleeding. Okay, uh, let's see here. So. 
For number five, effector, let me write up here since it's hard to see in the bottom. In your positive feedback loop, what is being affected? More platelets, because the more chemicals that are being secreted. And the platelets just keep coming until a plug is formed. Okay. Platelet plug forms. So I guess the response of this positive feedback loop is plug seals damaged area. And the bleeding has, you know, stopped. So there's a positive feedback loop in there to stop bleeding. Um, there's other things here that we use to talk about homeostatic mechanisms. There's two basic kinds of homeostatic mechanisms auto-regulatory and extrinsic. Let me read what I have on the slide. Autoregulatory, or what I have in parentheses, an intrinsic regulation. The homeostatic response occurs from within a cell, organ, or tissue. It all happens right there. There's nothing external that has to come into the situation to fix the problem. So I put a picture of this platelet plug thing as an example of that, because it all happened intrinsically right there. There was no hormone that had to come in. There was no nerve that made it heal. It all happened within the blood. Everything that you needed to plug that seal came from what was within the blood. Okay, so that's a good example of autoregulatory or intrinsic. Example, blood clotting. Most of the feedbacks we talked about are the, uh, the extrinsic regulation. The homeostatic process is initiated by activities from outside. So there's an imbalance and something outside communicates with other cells to correct the imbalance. And those are mostly what we talked about this morning. Extrinsic. regulation. So the examples we talked about, hormones from the endocrine system, and you can kind of top that in the next class, but hormones, the ones we talked about this morning, are insulin and glucagon. These are chemical messengers that were traveling in the bloodstream to correct something, blood, blood glucose levels. Insulin, glucagon. And the other thing we talked about to regulate blood, uh, not blood, body temperature, those afferent, efferent pathways, that, that was the nervous system. The brain controlled that. So I'll put a CNS. So boom, in, in a nutshell, number one, hormones, endocrine system, number two, CNS. Those are the two systems in physiology that accomplish basically all homeostatic mechanisms. Okay, so I just differentiate those two. And we're done with this batch of slides. What I want to do now is go into biochemistry. Let me open up those slides. Before I get started, um, before I forget, I want to pass these out. I'll put them over here. You can just kind of help yourself. Monday's lab is a microscopy lab, and I have it printed out for you here. So just take one and look over it and keep it for Monday. The other thing is a homework assignment. It's homeostasis <coughs> practice. I have all these things here, and I just have 
Well, I don't have just six steps. I have seven steps. The seventh thing is I ask you, is this positive or negative feedback? Because I did define those. And just do it uh, over something like 10 points. Homework assignments, I don't grade very carefully. I just grade to see that you did it and you really tried. And um, I don't mark things wrong. But pretty much if you just um, do the assignment, you get full credit. But what I do to give you feedback is I'll, I'll post a key after the due date. So do this over the weekend, turn it in Monday. I'll leave it over here. So everyone help yourself. We're going to continue on here. <laughs> Biochemistry. I'm not going to cover the whole chapter because chemistry is a prereq. But what I'll focus on is kind of what's more relevant for A and P. That would be uh, carbs, lipids, and proteins. They come up a lot, so we'll focus on that. The study of organic compounds. We'll start with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. By the way, we're in chapter two now, moving away from chapter one. Sometimes I abbreviate carbohydrates CHO because they are molecules that contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, CHO. And the ones you got to know, monosaccharides, they have listed glucose, fructose, Galactose. Those are the hexose sugar. I mean, it's the six, uh, well, they have six carbons, hexose, but 
know those three. Don't worry about ribose, deoxyribose. I'll mention those when I teach DNA. Okay, so glucose. Um, fructose, galactose. Another one I mentioned, the circulation form of sugar, boom, this one. Okay, that's, that's the one. That's blood sugar. When people say blood sugar, they mean glucose. That's the circulation form of sugar. Uh, fructose is like found in fruits. Galactose, you can find it in milk, okay? But the blood sugar is glucose, know that. Um, you can link these together. These monomers can be linked together. The monosaccharides can be linked to form disaccharides. If you're linking them together, that's a dehydration synthesis reaction because water is given off. Okay, that's the top one. So two monomers get um, basically two monosaccharides become one disaccharide. Dehydration synthesis reactions link monosaccharides together. So the opposite would be, well, let's kind of list the um, disaccharides you should know. Here's one example here. Sucrose, okay. Disaccharides are shown on the next slide. Sucrose, maltose, lactose. Disaccharides are sucrose. Now, sucrose is comprised of when you link glucose to fructose. Okay. I'll just put glu plus fru for short. Uh, maltose is a glucose linked to another glucose. Link to another glucose. And uh, lactose is a galactose linked to a glucose. So I'll put GAL galactose um, plus a glucose. So basically, sucrose is table sugar. Maltose is obviously malt sugar, and lactose is the sugar in milk. Now, when the body kind of, um, say you eat sugar and drink milk, the body uh, digests, and you take up all of these um, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and you, you can store them in the form of polysaccharides. I already mentioned this, glycogen, right? Glycogen is the storage form of carbohydrate. Glycogen is the storage form of carb, C-H-O. Glycogen is stored primarily in the skeletal muscle, but also the liver. That's where you have your glycogen stores. Liver, skeletal muscle. And we learned the hormones that form glycogen. Which one? took the monomers and linked them on to the glycogen. Was it insulin or glucagon? Yeah, insulin was the tissue building one. 
But what was the one that broke the glycogen down for your workout? Glucagon. Okay? So you store it up, and you, you kind of break it down, depending on what you're doing. Uh, let's move on from carbs to lipids. Any questions on carbohydrates? contain the C, the H, and the O, but just in different proportions. They have more carbon and hydrogen proportionally than uh, carbohydrates do. Now, here are the examples in biology, human uh, physiology, that we come across a lot. Triglycerides, eicosanoids, phospholipids, glycolipids, steroids. They're all under the umbrella of lipid. Let's talk about triglycerides first, okay? Let's see. Well, here's um, the formation of triglyceride lipids. Triglycerides are the storage form of fat. Does the body store fat? I mean, you don't have to be a physiologist to know. I got some right here, right? Maybe you got some back there. I don't know. So we call it sub Q, right? Subcutaneous tissue. Um, usually, what happens is when you're kind of young, young child, and you basically have very low body fat. And over time, as you grow up and you, you, you're well nourished, and the fat starts to marble in your muscle, say in teenage years. Okay? Now, when that gets maxed out, the muscle marbling maxes out, then you start to kind of increase it uh, sub Q. On average, people are about 20% body fat. Okay? Let's see, we're mostly muscle. Your lean mass is the other 80%. Lean mass is muscle, bone, and blood. Uh, the rest is fat. So triglycerides are, are the molecule of how we store it for energy. And um, it, it's good for you to know that there's only two molecules your body can use for fuel. One is carb, your glycogen. This is the other one. That's it. There's nothing else. Um, I'm going to draw like an upside down E as a simplified form of triglyceride because there's three things here. On top there, this is a three carbon chain. It's a, call it a glycerol backbone. That's the structure of triglyceride. Three carbon glycerol backbone. And at each position, one, two, three, there's a, there's a hydrocarbon chain called a fatty acid. At each carbon position, is a hydrocarbon uh, fatty acid chain. Hydrocarbon, continue up here. Fatty acid chain. It's just carbon and hydrogen. If you look at the picture, if you add one on here at the first position, then add on another one, add on another one. So I'm just trying to like, you know, this is chemistry, right? This is how you symbolize the chain. And um, yeah, that's how you do it. That's how you form it. 
<clears throat> so insulin could help do that, right? Assuming there was fat in the meal you ate. Now there's some details here, different kinds of fat. There's saturated fats. You know, like when you read the nutrition label and it says fat content and under that is like saturated fat, what does that mean? It means the hydrocarbon chain is saturated with hydrogens, okay? In other words, there's no double bonds, like you remember in chemistry. Well, let's say all these are saturated. Let me define saturated fats. Hydrocarbon chains. contain no double bonds. When you have no double bonds, that allows the chain to be more or less straight. Okay? It's no double bound bonds basically, I don't know, allows the chain to be straight. Because the chain is straight, there's no double bonds, the molecules compact close together. Molecules, these triglycerides, molecules pack tight. So at room temperature, this kind of fat would be solid, like butter, right? So I put butter there. So I'll put that over here. Solid at room temp. Because the molecules are packed closer together, it can be a solid mass. Now if you have um, double bonds in the chain, uh, I guess you would be unsaturated. Nutritionists say the unsaturated fats are more healthy. I think that's kind of a, I don't know if that's the best way to put it. They're not healthy. They're just less um, heart disease causing, I guess. They reduce your risk by, how, okay, basically, if your fat intake is a lot, let's say like your cardiovascular risk is a lot, but if you change out some of those saturated fats with unsaturated fats, maybe the risk reduces a little bit, but there's still risk. And so, in terms of uh, heart health, um, these are a little better than the saturated fats. In terms of just the molecular biology here, the hydrocarbon chains have one or more double bonds in it. One or more double bonds in the chain. Whoops, one or more, one. One more double bonds in the chain. If you got one double bond, you would call that monounsaturated. If there's more than one, just call it polyunsaturated. So differentiate between mono unsaturated versus poly. <coughs> and that's not hard to remember because mono means one, one double bond. And they have a picture of it on the uh, slide there. What the double bond does, it puts a kink in the chain. the double bond puts a kink in the chain and what it does is it forces the molecules to be further apart so at room temperature the, that fat would be liquid liquid at room temp like olive oil 
Phospholipid. Okay, let's look at the picture of that. Moving on from triglyceride to phospholipid. So before I do that, this is just one fatty acid chain, right? What I should have mentioned is um, what I drew on the board here is this. This is uh, unsaturated. Is this unsaturated? Yes or no? No, it's not. This is saturated. What about this one? Yeah. So what does your body do with this fat? You use it for energy. Like I said, when you work out, there's enzymes in your skeletal muscle where you have fat that literally cleave off the fatty acids. The fatty acids can circulate in the bloodstream and your muscles use them for energy. Okay, when you burn fat during your workout. So when your trainer or PE teacher says, hey, you gotta burn that fat, it's literally the fatty acid that's being used for fuel by the muscle cells. Okay, I'll write that down. It's important. Lipase can cleave off fatty acids into the bloodstream. Muscle cells use them for energy. Exercise increases that light pace activity, so you just kind of burn more fat during your workout. Um, let's move on to a different kind of lipid, the phospholipid. It still has that glycerol backbone. Phospholipid is a type of lipid. There are many different kinds of phospholipids. One we usually talk about, and you see in this book, is phosphatidylcholine, a type of phospholipid. An example of a phospholipid. Phosphatidylcholine. And you still have the three carbon uh, backbone of glycerol, shown in the figure there. So carbon, 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 that's our glycerol. And at each of the first two positions, you have a hydrocarbon chain, our fatty acid. And the second carbon position, they put a double bond in it to kind of like give it a kink. And then at the third position is a polar phosphate group. I'll put P for phosphate. The third position there. That's what you see illustrated. So uh, this whole thing is phospholipid. Uh, this end, they're saying, is not water soluble. It is hydrophobic. So they call it nonpolar, hydrophobic. Okay. Nonpolar, hydrophobic, the, the tail end. But this end is hydrophilic, it's polar. Um, the main function of phospholipid that we talk about is you have a phospholipid bilayer in the cell membrane.
So this molecule is simplified by that. The books usually kind of draw it like that. So if you have a bilayer of this, and the other layer kind of faces like that, a piece of a cell membrane, we call this the phospholipid bilayer in cells, cell membranes. Phospholipid bilayer in cell membranes. The polar heads face the watery environment, whether it be inside the cell or outside the cell. Okay? So this polar heads face water. This end faces water. Face water. However, this kind of zone in between where the tails face each other is a hydrophobic zone. That zone is very important to understand because molecules that have to interact with cells, molecules that are polar, can't get through that zone. They cannot pass. Polar molecules. You know, like, for example, a sodium ion, as an example, it has a full positive charge. It's polar. Polar molecules, like, for example, sodium, can't pass the hydrophobic zone. Okay, let's move on. Let's, uh... There's a picture of it, the polar head, the hydrophobic zone that we just kind of uh, illustrated there. Another class of lipid is eicosanoid. And this isn't talked about so much in 4.3. So for this test, I won't hold you responsible for eicosanoids. I'll just kind of write that. Not responsible. Good news of the day. Don't got to know that. So I've got a picture of it there. You can look at it on your own if you want. Uh, that's talking about the bio 431. But I do want you to know steroids for this test. Uh, <laughs> steroids are derived from cholesterol. And there's the structure there. Actually, this is cholesterol. Okay. It, it's four interlocking hydrocarbon rings. That's a steroid. Still talking about lipids. So steroids are considered lipids. They're like all the other lipids, they're kind of like, um, well basically they're nonpolar. Well the structure is four interlocking hydrocarbon rings. Basically, you get a benzene, right, linked to another benzene, this one here. Yeah. Basically, that structure. Okay, and steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol. 
because cholesterol has this structure. <coughs> Steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol. Steroid hormones, give a couple examples. Estrogen, testosterone. Testosterone is the male king androgen hormone, so that's why I put a little crown there. But you know, as you can see, they, they have the basic structure there, right? They're a little bit different than cholesterol. So example, estrogen, testosterone. The sex hormones are taught more detail in Bio 431. Let's just kind of know them as examples of steroids. So steroid is the last lipid class, I'll have you know. And I want to move on to the other biochemistry molecules, proteins. Okay. Let's talk about amino acid structure, because those are the building blocks of proteins. Moving on. What I'm writing is amino acids are the building blocks, the monomers, of protein. Protein is it. It is the molecule that cells can make for all the like different kinds of proteins for cell function, for body structure. And um, one amino acid has essential carbon surrounded by four different positions. And you can see from the picture there, uh, you have a carboxylic acid. You have hydrogen over here, and you have an amine group on this side here. And you have a functional group designated by a generic symbol R. So these are the building blocks of all proteins. You can link them together. Um, well, you should know that here's a few listed there. Cysteine, lysine, aspartic acid, glycine, um, so that this green box here contains a different functional group, but they all have the carboxylic acid, the hydrogen, and the amine group. So the functional group varies from amino acid to amino acid. There's like 20 of them, and then with those 20 amino acids, you can link them together. chemical bond that links together amino acids is called a peptide bond. Peptide bonds link amino acids together.
thing about um, amino acids is <laughs> you need to ingest protein to get protein, okay? So in the food you eat, there's what's called, for these 20, there's what's called um, essential and non-essential amino acids. This is more for a nutrition class, I'll just mention it here. Essential, non-essential. That term used in nutrition means an essential amino acid is you have to eat it in your diet, okay? Like soy or meat. Non-essential means, well, you should still eat it, but your body could make it on its own if you don't eat it, all right? And I can't even remember which amino acids are essential or non-essential. I'm not going to hold you responsible for that. I'm not even going to hold you responsible for knowing all 20 amino acids, but I at least want to show you a picture of one. Categorized based on functional group, but there's 20 of them. So these 20 building blocks build all the proteins in biology. Okay. The plant sources are the best source of protein, not meat. Okay. Because plants are the organisms that can extract these molecules out of the soil. Okay, they, they, are, they are the original source. I think there's a misconception. People think like meat is the best source, but it's not. When you eat flesh of, a, of an animal, that's just when they ate the grass and made, made it. Okay. And you know, it's also um, higher in fat content. Red meat is carcinogenic, so there's all kinds of like um, studies that can show that. But for us, just know that you have to ingest the amino acids so that the cell can make proteins and give you every kind of molecule that the cell needs. And the diversity of proteins, I put a list of them here. These are all the different kinds of proteins that cells will make. And you should know these. They're all listed in the chapter here. Uh, structural proteins. I'll, I'll kind of title this part of the lecture is diversity of proteins. Simply put, these are all the proteins your body cells can make. Structural proteins, um, mechanical support, they give an example of collagen. Collagen can provide the structural support for cells or tissues in your body. Enzymes are proteins. What enzymes do is there are molecules that lower the activation energy for chemical reactions. So basically they speed up chemical reactions. Speed up chemical reactions. by lowering what's called the, the you know the energy of activation. So they show a picture of that there. Or the enzyme is able to catalyze the formation of a um, disaccharides, okay, whether it's taking it here and the enzyme breaks it apart. Okay, it speeds that up. When I said lower activation energy, I'm saying that 
less energy required. So that in that way, it speeds it up from, say, reactants to product. Okay. So no enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. There's a lot of transport proteins. Uh, Hemoglobin is one example. Hemoglobin is a tetramer. It has four pieces. They're all linked together. And those little red balls illustrate oxygen binding to hemoglobin to be transported. Binds O2. Okay, and it circulates it in the blood. So hemoglobin is the primary molecule found in RBCs. The red blood cells. Red blood cells are about half of your blood. They circulate oxygen in that way. So proteins can also be um, what are called contractile proteins. These proteins are filaments. They're long threads and some are thick and some are thin. They essentially call them thick and thin filaments. Contractile proteins, I said thick and thin filaments, thick, thin filaments, the thick filament, the one on the bottom in the picture is called myosin. The thin one is actin. And what you see in the picture is the formation of a cross bridge. They actually link up, and then there's this pivot of the myosin head that moves the actin passive. Okay, so that, in that way, muscle can contract because this is happening from two different directions. Well, anyways, we'll learn about that process later. Just know that proteins can contract, shorten. That's what contract means. Not expand, contract. Uh, so the details of that later, there's, there's contractile proteins, there's also communication proteins. There are proteins that live in the phospholipid bilayer that can act as chemical messengers as shown in the picture. Communication proteins. They're literally in the cell membrane. They can help, like for example, polar molecules. Um, they can help polar molecules communicate with the cell. Here's a chemical messenger. Let's say it's polar. It can't get through the phospholipid bilayer to communicate with other molecules on the inside of the cell. So it kind of needs to go through this chemical messenger, this purple receptor. And when it binds, it'll activate some other molecule on the inside. Okay, But it itself never passes through. So that's why you need proteins that are communi communication proteins that live in the cell membrane. Proteins can be uh, defensive. Immunoglobulins. Also called antibodies.
the antibodies, well, you learn about them in immunity, they can kind of arrest, bind up pathogens in the body, and then other cells can come and destroy them. So they have a defensive function, and um, they also are involved in transport work. Biology books like to, like to use the term channel, transporter, and pump to illustrate proteins in the cell membrane that do transport work. A channel is a protein in the cell membrane that has a pore through it, usually. It goes straight through. It's embedded in the bilayer. So channel. The pore is always open, but it can only fit molecules with that precise size. So other molecules cannot get through. And all of these molecules are polar, okay? Because polar molecules are going to bounce right off. But it could go through a protein channel if one is there. So the channel is always open. A transporter, it may have um, maybe a shape like that. It's also polar, transports polar molecules that can't get through. So maybe this is a polar molecule, this little purple triangle, it, it normally couldn't get through, but if it had a transporter, it could fit that shape. Transporters can change their shape to deliver us to the other side. So maybe the, the shape of the uh, transporter will change its shape from that to that, just illustrating the point, so this now gets in. Okay. That, when books say transporter, that's usually what they mean. These first two examples, channel and transporter, you don't expend energy to do it. You can assume these molecules are just flowing down their concentration gradients. Okay. However, sometimes cells will work against the gradient. To do that, you need to expend energy. And that's um, when the word pump is used. Pump implies expending energy. So let's say well, that's what's kind of shown here. This is a pump. Just draw it as a circle. <clears throat> Let's say you're trying to move the orange ball outside on top here. There's more on the outside. Normally things go from high to low, but if you want to pump it from low to high against the gradient, the cell needs to expend energy to do it. So what happens is, there's an ATP, and the cell can take that and just kind of cleave it off, forming ADP plus an inorganic phosphate. That's what the picture shows there, you're kind of cleaving it off. And that release, when you break chemical bonds, you release energy, and the energy provided by the expenditure of ATP can pump it out. Think of ATP as just an A 
with a phosphate, with a second phosphate, with a third phosphate. That third phosphate contains the most energy that is released when you break it. Okay, so just kind of break that, boom, and then energy is released, the cell does work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Let's take a break and we'll come back and talk about protein levels of structure. Take a 15-minute break. So come back at 9.35.